Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Welcome to all the folks that are watching online. My name is Holmes Hummel. I become a frequent flyer of the Energy Seminar after returning to Stanford as the managing director for the new portfolio in energy equity and just transitions. I'm really pleased to be subbing in for John Wyant today, who's not with us. He's our perennial hero for the Energy Seminar. And it's my honor to introduce the person who will be introducing our main guest. Uh, Professor Megan Mauter is the director of the Water and Energy Efficiency for Environment Lab, which is associated with the Woods Institute for the Environment and the Civil Engineering de Department at Stanford University. I know Megan as a champion for systems level thinking and integrating water and energy as two very large systems that deliver essential resources, but also have dramatic potential for demand side flexibility and dramatic potential for energy efficiency. It's with Megan Mauter's vision that we're honored to be hosting today our featured speaker. And with no further ado, I'm gonna give you Professor Mauter. Thank you, Holmes. Sometimes you wish you could um, introduce yourself as eloquently as Holmes manages to introduce you, so thank you. Um, it is actually, uh, the reason that we're here today though is that um, we're honored to bring Dr. Carolyn Schneider uh, in for a seminar. Uh, Carolyn was a EIPER PhD student here. Um, EIPER is an interdisciplinary PhD program. Um, and so when I was sending out emails, um, it, sort of eliciting interest in having her come back to campus uh, and uh, having her meet with uh, faculty across campus, there was Overwhelming excitement uh, to see an alum that had so successfully launched her career in the energy space and is continuing to make a tremendous amount of impact. Um, Carolyn is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Buildings and Industry um, within EERE's uh, or within DOE's um, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. Um, under that uh, role, she oversees $800 million in annual R&D funding um, across several offices. One is the Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office, under which the National Alliance for Water, uh, sorry, the National Alliance uh, for Water Innovation sits, or NAWI. Um, but she also oversees building technologies, um, Advanced Manufacturing and Advanced Materials and Manufacturing uh, Technology Office uh, and uh, has actually covered a much broader portfolio of uh, offices um, during her time at uh, EERE. So with no further ado, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Carolyn about both the um, industrial space and the building space and opportunities uh, for R&D activity um, across, uh, across those portfolios. Um, Megan, thank you for that introduction. Holmes, so great to see you. We uh, were uh, classmates in the early days of EIPER. So the goal today is to give you um, two major updates from the federal government. One is around a new blueprint to decarbonizing our building sector, and the other is our latest analysis for decarbonization for the industrial sector. And I'm going to try to split the time 50-50 between the two updates and then make sure we've got lots of time um, for questions at the end. Megan already introduced this, but just to give you a sense of um, where I am in the U.S. Department of Energy, I oversee three major offices, one focused on building technologies, another on advanced materials and manufacturing technologies, and then we recently created an office solely focused on industrial efficiency and decarbonization. Um, and across all of these, we have the Better Buildings Initiative, which also has our Better Climate Challenge that works with thousands of companies around these broader goals. Okay, so when I say our national targets, I wanted to start by centering us with um, this administration's commitments on climate and energy. The first is around our national greenhouse gas reduction goals the second around clean electricity in particular of 100% clean electricity by 2035. And then also, especially with Holmes kicking us off today, a commitment to focus on energy justice, energy equity and environmental justice issues. And I, I really enjoy, I know it's weird to say I have a favorite quote from an executive order, um, but I, I really 
love this line that I've pulled out here in the bottom of the slide um, from one of the early executive orders on climate change in this administration, which is the focus that when we talk about decarbonizing sectors in our country, this has to be something that has the full focus across the full federal government, every corner of our nation, every level of government, every sector of our economy, every university, um, research across the board. So that's the holistic perspective that you'll be hearing from me that we took to our planning process. Okay, so we're gonna start with buildings. We recently, last month, released the first national comprehensive strategy for decarbonizing our building sector. We had um, a starting point of having a people-centered approach and a people-centered strategy. And starting from the tenet that everyone deserves to live in a safe and healthy home with access to affordable, clean, and reliable energy. And to have that be the starting point for a conversation around what are the different pathways and different goals for decarbonizing the U.S. building stock. Why buildings? Why am I talking about buildings today and what is their role with our climate and energy priorities? Well, buildings are around a third of national greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they are where we all live, learn, sleep, eat. Um, they also are a very energy intensive part of our economy. Buildings waste roughly a third of their energy, which is around $100 billion that we are having leak through our um, building system each year. There are also a conversation around 2050 goals with buildings is a conversation about buildings that are here today. So existing buildings, roughly 75% of residential buildings and around half of commercial buildings that are here today are going to still be here in 2050. So when we talk about ambitious climate and energy goals, we have to talk about how we're going to retrofit buildings, which in many cases is a much more challenging task. I started with the target around uh, clean electricity grid by 2035. Well, let's talk about who's consuming that electricity. Three quarters of today's electricity consumption is at buildings. So bu buildings are a critical partner in achieving our clean electricity goals. And then lastly, and this is an area of, of growing interest, buildings are where what we call grid edge resources intersect with the distribution system. So when we talk about electric vehicles and tra electrifying transportation, often that connection happens through a building system or a building facility. When we talk about energy efficiency priorities, when we talk about um, resilience challenges, when we talk about a clean electricity distribution system, these intersect and electrifying um, many building end uses. This all comes often to intersect at a building. And when we approach a building's grid edge in a different way, we can have massive savings from across um, the electricity system, the energy system. In addition, um, buildings are both a source of pollution as well as um, the place where we experience indoor air quality challenges and indoor air pollution. For example, twice of the air pollution from gas appliances are in our country relative to gas power plants. Um, in addition, we have a significant number of households in our country experiencing energy insecurity, where they're struggling to pay their energy bills, and roughly one in five households in the United States are behind on a monthly energy bill payment. We often see that the burden of both energy costs as well as pollution are borne inequitably across our country. For example, recent studies have found that black children in our country face roughly twice the incident of asthma relative to the average American. So how do we bring all of these different perspectives together to identify a new blueprint for the United States around near zero emissions in our building sector? The four pillars that we've identified through stakeholder process and analysis um, are probably common themes that you experience in your own research in your courses. First of all, energy efficiency is more important than ever. The value of addressing on-site energy use, um, regardless of the source of that energy supply, pays off in a variety of different value propositions, reducing the size of the problem, addressing affordability, and enabling that decarbonization of the power sector that we talked about earlier. Second, we have to address on-site emissions if we're going to achieve the energy goals. And heat pump technologies are a very promising application, but there's still much research to be done for some building types. Third, I talked earlier about transforming this grid edge to address the 
overall electrical infrastructure costs that'll be associated with electrification, we need to have a tripling of demand flexibility, we estimate, as well as continued integrated planning of our electricity system and our building system and our transportation system. And then lastly, buildings themselves also have an emissions footprint through the embodied life cycle of the construction process, the retrofit process, and the materials that are in those buildings. Across those four pillars of activities, the main um, key themes that we called out, which I touched on earlier, one is around equity, advancing energy justice and benefits to disadvantaged communities, and we'll come back to that theme. The second is we have to address affordability across our country. That also has synergies with competitiveness of our companies. And then lastly, resilience is a continuing and growing theme in our nation's buildings around how can we do these investments in a way that make communities safer and more resilient across challenges. I'll point out um, on the equity theme, um, and Holmes was a great inspiring speaker and thought partner with many of our teams, um, we've put together one of the first energy earth shots, well, the first people-centered energy earth shot at DOE, which is focusing on how can we reduce by half the cost to decarbonize affordable housing in our country, while also reducing energy bills by 20%. And we really think of this as, as flipping the prioritization where we're having equity-focused R&D from the very beginning at Department of Energy. So what do the results look like from our initial analyses across these different pillars? The key takeaway, I would say, from the analysis so far, and a lot of this is consistent with other energy modeling analysis, one, the task before us is very challenging. Yes, we've achieved and continue to achieve energy efficiency savings across our economy, but we need to accelerate those changes at a scale that we have not seen previously. And additionally, in addition, we're going to have a wide range of technical solutions that are going to be um, leveraged to achieve these goals. To give you one example of the change in speed that we are going to need, currently around 1% to 2% of our country's buildings have major energy retrofits each year. To achieve the goals of getting through each of these buildings, we're talking about a 10 to 50-fold increase in some of the conversions and retrofit speeds across our building stock. Uh, an example shown here is looking at simple math around residential space heating conversions to address on-site emissions. And so we're talking about you know, a tenfold increase in the rate that we need to have that kind of market transformation. And this is not a new space. People have been working, many of the people in this room uh, and on the call, on energy efficiency challenge for decades. And to achieve this kind of accelerated um, deployment is going to be um, quite a, a unique combination of both policy and market transformation as well as R&D. To achieve, if we achieve these goals, when we achieve these goals, the benefits far exceed just a conversation around climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. The estimate is around seven quads of annual energy use will be saved um, through the efficiency pillar. Consumers across the country will be saving over $100 billion in annual energy costs, and that doesn't include the energy infrastructure savings. And I mentioned earlier the co-benefits of the other environmental and health outcomes. And here we estimate $17 billion in annual health outcomes, um, health savings, as well as a significant investment in high quality jobs. When we talk about, I say it's a blueprint, Part of the goal here was to outline what's the common framework we all need to be working towards. Another element was how do we organize ourselves at a federal government to make sure that we're investing in the right places and the right problems. And we came up with a, a new framework that helped us organize ourselves around where do we really need to be prioritizing programs. On one end of that spectrum you see here is to maximize technology performance and affordability. So cutting edge R&D that brings us new technology solutions that we can scale across the market. On the other end, we have, on the other end of that spectrum, we also uh, oversee our nation's appliance equipment standards programs. So we think of the R&D pulling the top of the leaders and then behind there we have making sure we're locking in those savings through building codes and equipment standards. And then in the middle, we continue to have a government role 
in being able to support and enable market innovation, as well as currently, especially with our uh, historic level of infrastructure investment from Congress through our bipartisan infrastructure law funding, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. But I would say that um, in the United States, we have much more a state and local government energy policy than a single national energy policy. And so when we looked at the kinds of transformations that needed to happen, it was very clear that there is incredibly core part of any conversation on energy policy in this country has to be about state and local tribal governments. And so we have um, a significant part of the blueprint focused on how can we as a federal government enable building decarbonization through supporting state and local governments with their various goals. And here's a quick snapshot of several of the um, options that we identified. We also, as thinking about it as a blueprint, divided the years between now and 2050 into three major tranches. The first, which is, as you can see with, and as apologies for the small text here, it's all available online. Um, the biggest amount of activity really needs to be front-loading now. The investments we make in R&D today, the investments we make in market transformations today are going to be what's enabling us to achieve those goals 10, 20 years out. There's a narrow window during which we can have what we would say was end of life. So when um, equipment's naturally being replaced or construction's naturally happening, that you have the market signals and the technologies there to be able to achieve your goals. If instead the window has gone much farther, then you're talking about early replacement timelines which have higher capital costs and losses to the system. And here, again, we've identified um, key activities across each of those pillars of opportunity and by decade, and really are welcoming the conversation around how we can better focus our energy and our intention across these pillars. Coming to a research campus, I did want to call out that there are a myriad of research themes and opportunities that we've identified through the blueprint process. And you see examples here from the analysis perspective, um, from our R&D portfolio. There really are a remarkable number of um, key ideas that have come out of the conversation today. And we welcome um, partners with researchers as we, as we um, identify where we work to invest in going forward. So, to wrap up our rapid tour of the building sector, um, I wanted to pause, and I should have done this from the beginning, but acknowledge uh, two colleagues um, were key in leading this process from a brilliant analytical perspective as well as stakeholder engagement. Um, Eric Wilson from the National Renewable Energy Lab and um, Jared Langevin from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, were an amazing DOE at its best, um, bringing together um, universities, but also our national labs. So this is the goal is to have this be a living document and an ongoing conversation. We're going to be having a variety of stakeholder engagement, um, webinar series. You can uh, use the QR code to download the blueprint. You can also just Google Building Decarbonization Blueprint DOE, and it'll take you right there. Um, please don't be shy with engaging with us. Our goal is to, to really have this be um, a structure that we're enabling more focused conversations from. Okay, that was our journey through the building sector. I will now pivot us to the industrial sector. Why the industrial sector in advanced manufacturing? Here again, um, roughly around a third of the nation's primary energy use and a little under that of um, primary greenhouse gas emissions come for our nation's industrial footprint. And it's important to realize that when we talk about the energy use, we're, it's very different than a building structure. And here, roughly half of industrial emissions come from the on-site demands to create heat for industrial processes. A myriad of industrial processes, but some that are incredibly high temperatures that um, make it that much more challenging to come up with decarbonization solutions. But there's also a good news story about our nation's industry and manufacturing, the push to grow U.S. manufacturing base is something that brings, you know, grows our GDP, brings local jobs, and can contribute significantly to the U.S. economy. So when we look forward, our goal is to have a perspective of how can we have decarbonizing American industry be a driver for economic opportunity. And there's many who say, you know, looking forward, the challenge ahead of us is one of the best economic opportunities of a lifetime, maybe several lifetimes, due to all the innovation and money to be made when we look at both 
domestic and international decarbonization of industry. The emissions profile of the U.S. industry um, has around five major energy intensive industries that roughly cover about half of the emissions. Um, it's important when we talk about industry to also include process emissions, not just energy related emissions. Um, great examples there are the cement um, production process where you have a lot of process CO2 emissions. Um, and then also, again, different emissions accounters will tell you different lines drawn. Um, but when we talk about the food sector, there is an important base from agriculture as well. In addition, if you map the industrial facilities across our country, they are often located in disadvantaged communities. And you can see the estimates here from the five major energy intensive mission industries. So when we talk about how can we map pathways to decarbonization for the industrial sector, it's an incredibly important moment to recenter in the history of environmental justice or injustices across our nation and where are there opportunities to be investing in communities and improving environmental and health outcomes. So where is DOE in analyzing the industrial sector? In 2022, so two years ago, we launched the industrial decarbonization roadmap where we identified four key pillars for investments in industrial decarbonization. So there's some similarities here um, with related to the building's decarbonization work. The first is that energy efficiency, again, is more important than ever. And I, um, oh, I missed getting to edit this one. So I uh, was just talking with several colleagues here earlier today that really it's not just energy efficiency. It's becoming very clear that material efficiency or circular economy is an incredibly important tool in our arsenal. And that water efficiency needs to be part of the conversation, both from a water management perspective, but also from the energy and emissions consequences from water. So we have efficiency in all its glory as one of our four pillars. Industrial electrification is a very promising resource for some temperature applications. Um, and it's not just a conversation around um, direct one-for-one -one electrifying heat production. In some cases, it's new chemistries, new processes entirely that can be electricity-based versus um, fuel-based. Low-carbon fuels, feedstocks, and energy sources. So that's a, a mouthful, but it's important to remind ourselves that in the energy, in the industrial sector, it's not just about the carbon footprint of the fuels. But there, especially in the chemical industry, we're talking about what is the carbon footprint of the feedstocks being used in different processes. And as the petrochemical industry evolves over the coming decades, what will that mean for the chemical industry? And different energy sources. And there's a lot of different um, potential paths of our future related to green hydrogen and whether it's um, produced on site or off site and what the transportation of that fuel would be, energy source would be. And then lastly, in some cases, we are not going to be able to get to our emissions targets without talking about carbon capture, or carbon utilization to achieve our goals. In addition, since the initial publishing of the roadmap, there has been a lot of conversations around, well, you kind of missed part of this. To accomplish each of those pillars, you need to have access to the kind of manufacturing innovations to make that possible, as well as the materials, critical materials that are often needed um, to achieve those different objectives. So that's a, a brief tour of the main research that had been done over several years at DOE. As part of that, we had analyzed the key, again, five top emitting in emission intensive industries or um, and you can see here the initial analysis results of how those different pillars are going to serve a role, at least in an economy, aggregated economic perspective. And the main takeaway here is that um, each of the pillars represented here in different colors are going to be very important in achieving decarbonization. It's going to vary by sector and by subsector how much of the different pillars come into play. Not surprisingly, energy efficiency and efficiency applications are more mature, so we see a more of efficiency coming into play early on. And then it's a fair question to ask me, well, what's that purple chunk at the end? Um, that was our alternative approaches was another way of saying, we haven't figured out a path yet that can really get us um, to net zero. So um, whether that's direct uh, carbon capture of different sorts or uh, 
it, it, it will require other sectors stepping up to be able to achieve those results. But that's an ongoing conversation. Last year, DOE published what we called our commercial liftoff reports on industrial decarbonization. The focus on this research last year was around the near-term funding that was available through the infrastructure law um, laws and a sense of, well, where are we with different technologies? How close are we to commercialization across different sectors in industrial decarbonization? And I'll say just recently, um, DOE announced $6.1 billion of investment based on the logic and thought process they went through as part of the liftoff reports. And a few key takeaways that I wanted to highlight from them, and I encourage you if you're interested to explore them online. The first is the, the investment scale that we're talking about of private capital per year to achieve the industrial decarbonization goals. And this, we broadened it to a few more sectors across eight major sectors. And that's on the scale of a trillion dollars a year. And the second is that it's estimated, and again, other research has found this number potentially to be even higher from the IEA, but something on the order of 60 to 80% of the emissions reductions that are needing to occur are from technologies that are nowhere near being commercialized today. And that is a jaw-dropping um, statistic, at least for me, compared to the building sector. What we're talking about here is that there is an incredibly important innovation gap that we need to be marshalling the best minds and resources across the country to be able to come close to our industrial decarbonization goals. Briefly, and this is a horrible government chart from lots of acronyms, but for those of you who do know the Department of Energy well, I wanted to emphasize that we're taking an all-hands-on-deck approach here, from basic early research to R and applied R&D, piloting and field validation, to these large-scale demonstrations that we're now able to fund with the new money from Congress, and to supporting at-scale uh, deployment through things like our Loans Programs Office, and then for our market transformation support where we're able to then accelerate adoption. We're pulling from all of the different parts of the agency as well as across different agencies. These conversations have been ones across the federal family um, with the Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Commerce, Department of Defense, et cetera. I also call it here, we have a second energy earth shot that I wanted to share, and that was a goal of becoming cost, finding technologies that are cost competitive with other fuel sources for industrial heat production and at the same time can reduce emissions by at least 85%. Um, it's a fun earth shot because we call it our heat shot, trying to make process heat sexy, um, but it's been a great rallying cry for the different technologies, opportunities that exist. Okay, so our looking forward new priorities in our industrial decarbonization, and especially for this seminar. Um, I, I have such fond memories from this seminar and from the great minds um, here and, and um, who have been part of this throughout time, and that's that we have a new analytical frame that we need to bring to industrial sector decarbonization. And what we're working on, and I know people throw around the word pathways, but I really mean pathways in its literal sense. And thinking back to my time in different engineering classes at Stanford, when we're talking about decision analysis and decision trees, we have to create analytical resources that can help the um, decision-making uncertainty that we need to do across different industrial sectors while we're having multiple system transformations happen at the same time. So we are not gonna have a single answer for any part of any sector across our country. There are going to be a variety of reasons why different facilities or different industrial processes will find different paths to decarbonization. And we need to be able to model that. We need to help um, infrastructure planners unpack that. And that process for us so far has been to have more ambitious, when we think about that innovation gap, let our modelers be freer of looking even higher up um, into earlier stage R&D technologies. We've expanded to additional sectors, including other manufacturing. Light and medium manufacturing can actually have even more um, commercially ready technology opportunities. And then also, as I said earlier, we have to have a rigorous way to analyze the impacts of these different paths and evaluate them around different economic metrics. I mentioned the environmental and health impacts, equity and environmental justice elements. Um, what will this mean for different communities depending on which facilities are retrofitted and which paths they take? The energy costs and infrastructure implications of different paths. 
workforce. And then when we're talking about US manufacturing, we're inherently talking about a conversation around national security, critical materials, as well as resilient supply chain. So these are some of the research questions that we are focused on now. And we are having um, a convening in just a few weeks to really kick off a much more extensive conversation with researchers like all of you and with industry on how we find a way to have a quantitative, analytically rigorous version of what I just said. Um, because our current modeling for industrial sectors um, is often uh, not at the level that we want it to be to be able to have these conversations. And that's been a partnership where we've been growing together. EMF had a focus only a few years ago on industrial decarbonization, and that's been really helpful in moving us forward. And the kinds of questions that we're looking at here are, what are the primary different archetypes for each industrial subsector? I showed you that bar chart. Well, there's you know a handful of different paths one can imagine a cement plant going through to be able to decarbonize. What do they look like? What are the decision points that will shape whether a facility or a company goes one path or the other? Which of these decision points need to happen at what timeline between now and 2050? Um, what are the primary drivers driving that type of thinking? Where are there similarities and differences across these different pathways? An area that you know, we really want to make sure we bring rigorous analytics to is the avoiding of stranded assets or you know, near-term wins that end up with longer-term dead ends. This is a, a sector that often have very long timelines for the facility. They're often facing ruthless international competition, especially when we're talking about commodity pricing. Um, and it's also one where we have long timelines for facilities. Once we put them in place, it is a very long lifetime before that um, investment is um, recouped. What are, how do we you know, identify those parallel processes we need to think about because we cannot do this in sequence. We can't wait for the technology to be there to then be market ready so that then we can start to build out the infrastructure. There's a lot of chicken and egg type of discussions happening, whether you're talking about hydrogen infrastructure, whether you're talking about carbon capture and utilization infrastructure, or really just um, the technology supply chain that would be required. It's also you know, often a risk averse environment when you have ruthless margins and you have very high expectations of the performance metrics that you need to achieve with your product. How do we help bring, how do we de-risk these different pathways? And then also our goal is not to pick certain pathways. So how do we make sure that we're fostering a competitive marketplace? I think multiple pathways is a good thing. We want to have a competition to figure out across these different decision points what is going to be the most successful metric, I mean, successful path to achieve our metrics. But that's not a single metric, right? We're not just talking about the economic outcomes. We have to be talking about the community impacts, the national security impacts, the supply chain impacts, et cetera. And then what are the different barriers? How are we going to keep checking back in on which pathway we're going down, where we're really pushing from a research and um, development perspective um, to assess what pivots we might need to make across the federal family? So. I said that we are um, having ongoing conversations. We're going to be having a workshop in mid-May focused on really kicking this conversation off in earnest. Again, as I showed, this isn't new. We're building off of previous research work and previous conversations. But the intention is to have a much more um, focused element around these building out of the different pathways. We're going to be having convenings for a variety of different um, industry groups as well to really have the hard conversations um, of what that 60 to 80 percent of unknown looks like and how do we plan from a societally optimal perspective across our country. So with that, before I hand it over to questions, I'm going to make a shameless plug for those of you in the room and joining us virtually. Please consider to become what we call at DOE a clean energy champion. Um, and for those of you that are professors, please encourage your students to think about um, a path in public service. And I've included some links there around opportunities both in our own group within DOE, across the federal government. And you know, I got my start in, in public service at a small state. Um, I really encourage people to think about the multiple opportunities at state and local governments as well. Um, we also are in the midst of greatly expanding our Clean Energy Innovation Fellowship with the goal of having a DOE-funded fellow at every public utility commission across the country. So if you want to 
take that analytical knowledge you have or technology elements and help make um, policy, support policy decision, informed decision making across the country. Um, I encourage you or your students to look there as well. So with that, uh, thank you for allowing me to entertain your Monday afternoon and I, I look forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, questions from the audience? Yep. So, um, these things take a long time. How do you incentivize long term thinking um, in, in general? I mean, especially in the department that probably has turnover every 20 years. Ah, so there's a couple questions in there. So, I'll, I'll start. I think one of the most humbling elements of this process was working back from 2050. 2050 is not that far away. And especially if you think about, okay, well, what are the market shares we'd have to reach by what time point so that we'd actually then have the stock turnover, for example, happen in time. Um, and it's really, it's been a, a big um, uh, motivating shot in the arm of like, we need to be more aggressive in our targets, in our prompts to US innovation of what we need to come up with because the time goes by really fast. Um, so that's one element. The other piece I'll say, and I'll uh, just a brief element from a government perspective. So I'm actually a, a career um, appointee or appointee, a career servant in federal government. So the vast majority of the federal government um, stays in their job and in their role across different elections. It's one of the most, uh, I think, beautiful parts of the United States of how we have you know a peaceful transition of government across um, this many workloads. So. Our goal is this isn't about a red state or a blue state or a red or blue politician. It's about the goals that we need to achieve for our country. And it's really important that we do this work in a way that we reach communities, states, where their priorities are, right? So you could have this conversation and focus it just on national security or just on energy affordability or critical materials concerns. It doesn't have to be about the greenhouse gas emissions or air and water quality. And so our, one of our, our major goals is to make sure that we create a decision support system, you know, data informed decision making that meets the decision maker wherever they may be. But yeah, we don't have time to come in and out. And I'll, I'll, one last piece, um, I also got my start in and state government during the Recovery Act, which was our last large energy infrastructure investment. And there's been a lot of great thought put into this round to make sure we don't kind of have a boom and bust. We can't just fund a lot of things and then have the funding go away. And so we really need to make sure that this is a sustained building. Um, because if bringing industry along, you're not going to de-risk anything <laughs> if you're making them think this is you know, a priority that's going to come and go with the winds. With rapid innovation and how they develop technology in these different spaces, how like what is the plan as to how you incorporate that into like industries that require like you know to incorporate that into like existing manufacturing practices and such uh, without you know like make those mistakes or if you're not too unsure about the technology itself. Uh, so uh, on the first part of your question, that's going to be a big part of the pathways element. If you if you think you're going to have access to um, hydrogen at a certain price with a certain emissions footprint, that could take you on a very different pathway than if you think because of where you are in the country or because of what you think that might be look like. Um, and we need to explore both. We need to be able to unpack those pathways. And then also um, both with hydrogen but also bioenergy, there's only going to be so much necessarily available across the country. So we can't each assume that we're going to have the full pie, right? And so we need to have that cross-systems perspective when we're triaging certain fuel resources or um, where infrastructure is being built. But we do have uh, hydrogen hubs being built you know, by the administration right now. And so making sure the demand side is there and what are the biggest use cases is a very vibrant discussion right now. Um, and I, to me, that's when I talk about data-informed decision-making, how do we learn from that and keep updating? These pathways are not something we're going to draw on Sharpie or etch in stone, right? It's how do we keep informing them and continue to, to learn? Um, and then on your question around you know, smart manufacturing and other implications of how we fold that in with de-risking, another great conversation earlier today is around, you know, we can't, if, if, if the assumption from industry is, well, I, I can't trust this because I need to know 20 years from now, is this material going to perform the same way? Um, 
there's a lot of really interesting innovation out there, whether it's digital twins or other types of um, physical testing we can be doing that help us save time to de-risk things. Um, I, so it's almost like innovation around the innovations needed, but that's what we need, right? We need to look at all the barriers and figure out how do we innovate our way to a faster solution. Um, so considering that energy efficiency, as you showed, is, is a major part of the blueprint, um, and that retrofitting is going to have to be a major part of this, and that um, a major part of like energy efficiency um, in buildings has to do with the kind of fundamental structure of the building, as far as I know, so it's beginner and all this, but how do you plan to take all of those things into consideration as you think about energy efficiency? So one of my, um, one of the wonderful program that we launched a couple years ago, we call it our Buildings Upgrade Prize. And the problem statement for that is exactly what you were just asking. Okay, well, how do we find, what are, what is the, what's the barrier and what are the innovations we need to address major retrofits that you need in a building's envelope, for example? Um, when I say that, like air, air sealing, insulation, windows, doors, attic, um, and our approach was we don't have the answer. So instead, we funded 45 community projects across the country to come up with their own innovations of how do they unlock the financing needed, how do they work with workforce. In some cases, it is new R&D. We've got um, an iRobot prize that's looking at drones in attics, helping us address you know, better air sealing solutions. And so our, my, my approach to the question is like, you know, we really need to let the full suite of innovation that might be innovation in regulatory structures. That might be innovation in data collection. It might be innovation in testing new materials, or it might be you know, really cool new R&D and technology. And we need to make sure that we're um, enabling all of those conversations, but at the same time, we can't equally invest in everything, right? So we have to have a ruthless evaluation process to get a sense of, okay, what's really gonna unlock scale? What's really gonna accelerate retrofits? But it's, it is, um, millions of buildings a year that we need to get to, and not just with low-hanging fruit investments, with deep energy retrofits and while addressing on-site emissions. And there's enough hard to decarbonize applications that we can't just let um, opportunities go by the wayside. Um, electrification is a big uh, issue uh, for energy. Um, if I look at industry or if I look at building or digging uh, and transport, what are your estimates? How much electricity will be used? So the modeling estimates vary on that. Um, I will, uh, one comment and then I'll answer the question. One of the exercises I, I did with our an analysis team was, well, for buildings especially, if you electrify space and water heating, you actually get major energy efficiency benefits. So not only are you addressing on-site emissions, heat pump technologies are more efficient from an energy perspective regardless of emissions. And so I said to them, well, how much of achieving our energy efficiency target is just achieving the on-site emissions one through heat pumps? And the, they came back and it's, it's quite, we have a substantial energy efficiency target above and beyond just the, the heat pump savings there. Um, to your, uh, wait, sorry, remind me the rest of the question. <laughs> how much electricity? Oh, yeah, how much electricity? Um, so there, it, it varies from some, some argue that it's, you know, it depends on how much efficiency we accomplish, right? But a lot of, some estimates are, you know, 50% more to doubling the total electricity demand, and that's with pretty aggressive energy efficiency. Um, I, I think that sometimes our modeling teams are more aggressive with renewable energy technologies than energy efficiency necessary. I'm not just saying that because Jim is in the, the front of the audience, but I, I, um, I, I think that there's more we could be doing with efficiency. In addition, when you think about the total elements, so part of it's about what, what your view of e-fuel or sin fuels will be, and so that's a big variation across the different models. Um, in addition, the size and scale, like the economics play out differently across the power sector, depending on what you assume happens behind the meter. So depending on how much you're dynamically managing load and doing a full value proposition, as I was talking about at the grid edge, 
if you optimize that, then there's less of a price signal for some of the larger generation build outs. So I'm hopeful that that can be you know, part of the solution as well. But most modeling shows significant growth in electricity demand when you're talking about electrifying transportation and buildings and a lot of industry as well. But I don't have a number that I picked up. I'm optimistic that we'll drive that down through efficiency. Jen? Go ahead. Uh, Carolyn, uh, um, some years ago, around, I guess, 2000, 2010, there was a set of National Academy studies that, that recommended at the end that you move towards more deliberate benefit cost analysis with, with uh, decision analysis in there, in there in order to make, make more um, systematic decisions of R&D. And EERE people, particularly Sam Baldwin, push back very hard against that systematic way of doing it. What's happened? Has that, that, that bubbled into what you're doing or not? So I can't speak to the history because I wasn't there then. Um, I will say the integrated system planning with robust decision analysis and cost-benefit analysis that draws the right circle, which is a much larger one than often happens in policymaking, has been a very strong priority across ERE and in collaboration with our Office of Electricity colleagues. So we're, we are marshalling together and we actually just launched a new website around holistically showing all the tools that we provide to be able to do better data informed decisioning like you're talking about with integrated resource um, planning, integrated distribution and resource planning. We also uh, launched the new fellows that I was talking about and we just released a joint notice of intent of R&D across that full space, across our vehicles office, our new joint office transportation, our solar office, um, our buildings and industry offices, and office electricity. Now, it also helps our assistant secretary for um, the Office of Electricity, Jean Rodriguez, comes from that perspective. So there's been a, we, it was not lost on us, Jim, that we had a special moment right now in the agency. And it's been, I, I think, a, a real, um, one of the most beautiful kind of working together across all the different sectors. And, I, and it's even more now we're just talk, uh, that it's not just integrated electricity system, right? You have to also talk about the gas distribution system and arguably the water system as well as part of all of that. But we, I see our national laboratories as a, a public good in that space. Are we doing the right data analysis and are we making it easy to use and providing free technical assistance to decision makers? So, I hope you would be proud of where we're going with it and what we accomplish with it. That's superbly good news because for a while it looked like it was going to be dead in the water because there was enough internal resistance, but it's wonderful to see that type of thinking. That's the best news I've had in a long time. Well, partially each sector kept coming up against the same barriers, right? So you had transportation come in and say, like, what is this about commissions and policy holding us back? You had buildings hitting that. You had the office electricity. You had resilience conversations. So it's been helped by that. Well, we love to end on good news. Um, <laughs> Jim's happy, so we're good. Oh, we're good. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, please join me in thanking Carolyn again for uh, joining us this afternoon.